And a very pleasant Monday evening here. Edison Hatter uh, hosting this Hamiltonian Day Roundtable Recap. Uh, happy to have a great group of panelists to uh, recap the greatest day on harness racing. A 16-race card. We went from nearly noon until 7 p.m. A massive day of racing. We saw the Hamiltonian. We saw the Hamiltonian Oaks. Lots of other great stakes races. There's a lot to unpack. And uh, with that, I welcome in the group of panelists we have uh, right to my left. Uh, we have Thomas Fenson. In this background there, we see Tactical Approach, the Hamiltonian winner. Thomas, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. We have Mike Ramosi, as always, from Not Who Picks. And, uh, Mike, you know, we're getting used to seeing you with the same background. You got to get one of those nice green screens. Yeah, I don't know how to do that. I don't know why. I'll figure it out. I don't either, to be fair. I've, I've had the same background for a while. But uh, below me, we have uh, Derek Givner, DRF Harness. And, hey, it looks like he has a Hamiltonian Day background as well. Yeah, we got Confederate up there. Always good to be on to talk some harness racing, especially Hamiltonian Day. And there's Garnett Barnsdale back from his uh, worldwide travels down to the Hamiltonian, uh, back through Saratoga, Finger Lakes, and he's made it back home to Canada. I did. They, I got pulled over at the border, but um, because I wasn't stashing anything, I guess they let me through. So here I am. Happy to be here. I think last time I talked to Ray Catola, who was in a volcano. So, Ray, I'm nothing fancy this time? Nothing for us? No, the volcano's under renovations. Turns out we didn't have it up to code. So, uh, it's going to be about like six to eight months before we get that uh, legal. <laughs> well, of course, uh, we'd like to begin by thanking especially the Hamiltonian Society for their uh, partnership here uh, to make this special roundtable recap happen. So, we're very excited to Break down everything that happened on Hamiltonian Day. Of course, we did the preview show as well, so we're always thankful to uh, Meadowlands Racing Entertainment for their sponsorship of our shows as well. And, uh, well, we will dive our way right into uh, the stakes races that were discussed on the preview show. We'll now recap them, and we will start our attention with race two, the Shady Daisy, a field of five. You know, uh, Garnett, uh, Beach Cowgirl, I think Joe Majorna said, tried to sneak up on Sylvia Hand over there on the inside. That obviously didn't work out. Sylvia continues to remain undefeated. You know, I was, um, I, I watched the race in the winner's circle, actually, which obviously is, you know, a little bit before the wire. And uh, I thought Beach Cowgirl was going to do it when they passed me, but, you know, um, I don't know. Sylvia's going to get beat one of these times. I mean, I, I just, it's, it's incredible. She looks disinterested gaps on the turn and, and gets the job done and you know great for her obviously i'm a big fan of, of the philly but you know she's going to get beat one of these times doing that and that was almost the time great great drive by joe bongiorno um he gave his his philly every chance um but uh you know the way these races played out i'm gonna have to switch my number one vote this week i don't see how anybody could you know if confederate's not unanimous i think it's going to be kind of bizarre to be honest Yep, you've already jumped in on the next topic point, Garnett. And I guess I should correct myself. I shouldn't say undefeated for Sylvie Hanover, but the, the the long win streak that she's currently on. And, uh, yeah, you and I both have votes in that top 10 poll. We'll, we'll get back to it again this week. And the last week, Sylvia Hanover, number one, 19 votes. Confederate gets 11 first place votes. It's my show got four. Cannibal got one. So, Garnett, you, you're pretty confident Confederate takes that top spot this week? I mean, look at the mile. He's 52 and two back half, pulling away by four lengths. He's the best horse in the sport, isn't he? I mean, I, I, don't, I don't even think it's disputable right now. So. Uh, I don't know if it's that obvious. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss that Confederate <laughs> race uh, later on in the show. We'll, we'll get back to that top 10 poll discussion a little bit later. But, uh, Derek, anything to add from what you saw in the Shady Daisy? I will say that I, I had Sylvia Hanover as my number one, and I changed it to Confederate this week. I already submitted it. Um, Listen, will she get beat at some point this year? You, you'd have to think so. I just don't see a horse right now at this time that's fast enough to beat her. I, I There was never a point where I thought Beach Cowgirl was winning that race. Just my opinion. You know, just knowing Sylvia Hanover, knowing the, the type of filly she is, I just, there was never a doubt in my mind she was going to win the race. And uh, it was, uh, he, he put in a good try, just as Belissa Hanover took a good try, but uh, she's just too good. I don't know how you how you say you don't know a horse that's faster than her because, like, granted, she did pull it out of the fire herself. She was the one who went first over in that race. But it seems like time and time again, the horses that get close to her are just victims of the happenstance that comes with races. Because we're talking about here, she's going to get beat. How's a, how's a horse faster than everyone else going to get beat unless these ones that seemingly are not as fast as her are just not getting the luck to go there? Horses way. get better, right? Horses yeah. get better as the year goes on. Some of these horses are going to get fat, a little bit faster or are going to be just sharp enough on that one particular day. I mean, listen, could she go undefeated? Yes, yeah, she could. 
but they could also take a shot in like the FanDuel championships at the end of the year and take a shot against Older and she could lose there. Um, I, I was more merely, likely she's going to lose one at some point than not. I was merely disputing the idea that there's no one faster than her right now because it very clearly really? Beach Cowgirl. Well, Beach Cowgirl had two lengths disadvantage on her. She came home with 25 and four. Like, I, what do you expect to come in with 25 and three? I, I, I still think that one of the things we're talking about with Sylvia is that the main competitors that are against her are at a disadvantage positionally a lot of times. It's what happened with Twin B. Joe Fresh and the Mistletoe Chalee. Peach Cowgirl had to make up ground on a better horse. I, she, I, I don't think it's a chance. Co- she had every chance in the stretch. I mean, she was even with her. If she's a faster horse, she wins. Well, I guess, Ray, the question to ask, at least that I question, is. Is also, you know, just because you see the chart, she wins by a head. I mean, we know her laziness. We know her racing style. I mean, have we really ever kind of found the bottom? I, I, I don't feel like she's ever been full out at the line to win a race recently. The, 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 the piece that I'll agree with, with what Garnsdale was saying, was when they did become head-to-head, you could see that Sylvia re-engaged, and it was in those final strides. Uh, but at the same time, yeah, we, we can't dispute that at the very least, Sylvia was in a better position than Beach Cowgirl. Sure, Sylvia had to go first over. Going first over isn't necessarily the best direction to go. And it's, but at the same time, she had less ground to cover than Beach Cowgirl had to. And Beach Cowgirl was coming back in off of a break and stride the week prior. That's why they took back this time around versus trying to go forward. But Lisa Mahanover, who's really good off a of pocket, went forward and then got lost on the lead. So I, my only contest here is the idea that no one's faster than her because while Sylvia has not gone to the bottom of the barrel, right now her head limits the amount of speed that can go her way. So that said, she's kind of at the whim of everyone else's speed to a degree in that way. And there are several horses in this division that seem as fast as her. Thomas, anything for you to add on this race? Yeah, yeah, there is with Sylvia Hanover. There is like you can't drive her in the lead because in the lead she is waiting for the horses and she can, like we saw in uh, Woodbine earlier, that she can somebody can just fly by her because she is sleeping when she is in the lead. And none horse can go first up or do the work every race this year. So I'm little on Derek's page there that she's gonna be beat because no, she has been working every time i know she is the best but um going first up through that the whole year or do the work when you can't drive her in the lead uh, i think some sometime somebody gonna beat her well mike we're also a gambling show here so we all seem to agree she can lose at some point she's one to 20 in this race that seems to be her settled price for at least the time being is it worth swinging against her in the next start the next one do you have to kind of see the fields how it sets up I'd be I'd be curious what the schedule is for starters. I'd be curious if they do any sort of smaller tracks with her because that's something that would be new, I think, for her that that would be a, definitely a challenge, especially the way she races. She wants that straight away at the end. That's huge for her. I don't know if they'd ever put her on a small track if I were them. I don't know if that's good or bad. I would take a shot next time. Why not? Um, you don't have much to lose going against her uh, really any time. I mean, I realize that she keeps winning, but when you're 1 to 20 every race, I, I'm always trying to beat you. Well, we saw Sylvia Hanover pretty dominantly take the Shady Daisy. And uh, race three, you know, uh, an interesting race there in the Steel Memorial. uh, Ray, we saw Fashion Schooner break there right at the start. But uh, MM's Dream and Jiggy Jog, and it's MM's Dream for a second consecutive start, knocking off Jiggy Jog. Well, and the outside post really did Jiggy Jog in once the gates left. Uh, Because with MM's dream, the thing that I've noticed with her is she's got plenty of muscle, plenty of power. You can see why um, Baldacino talks about wanting to go to like the international trot with her. Barring smaller track annex, going the mile and a quarter might actually be to her interest. She loves to just keep plugging forward. That said, though, it does take her a little bit to hit her top gear, and sometimes that's been to her disadvantage, like when she lost a fashion schooner. Um, and then that mile and an eighth of the Hamiltonian maturity, you saw it was in that last 16th. That's when she really engaged late. Um, so Dave putting her on the lead was probably the best case scenario. And then the greatest case scenario was Dexter having to come from off a helmet. Uh, Jiggy Jog, I don't know if from the outside post they wanted to take back for one because of they were coming in from a loss or if just the way the race shaped out, they wanted to just get away unhurried, hope they could get into the mix then. But 
Uh, Dave clearly has figured out MM's dream can just keep rolling. And at that point, I think any time uh, she can get to the lead, for one, Fashion Schooner's doomed because she can't get a loose lead anymore. And two, that means that they're going to have a really tough one to catch. Mike? I think a couple things happened. I mean, Fashion Schooner busted at the start. That changed the race significantly because she likes to be up front. She likes to press the pace. Well, she was gone. So... Now you have MN Stream by herself, and and I don't know. Dexter decided to win the first race, and then I don't know what happened to him the rest of the night because uh, he just, I don't know. I mean, I wasn't crazy about the drive personally, especially on you know you have the best horse and you're sitting all the way the whole way around the racetrack, and she come home twenty five and four. Well, how much faster is she going to come home in the race? I mean, really? I mean, it, I just I don't know. I, I wasn't crazy about how the race set up. I think it changed a lot from the start. I thought that. You know, MM's dream got away with murder up front, and then she was able to win easily at the end. And and that's just how it goes sometimes. And that's what you want when you have a price horse or you have something that that can get an easy lead because that's what you're when you're betting like that. You want that. You want that scenario. So, but if you're betting jiggy jog and you're seeing that race, you know that, that like ten seconds into the race, you're not winning. Garnett, I saw you agreeing there with Mike about the complexion changing at the start. Yeah, I mean, that was one of the – I actually put that in my race recap. And then when we got the quotes, Tietrich uh, commented on it – or um, I'm sorry, um, Dave Miller. And uh, it fit right into my story. Yeah, the, the the complexion of the race changed right at the start when Fashion Schooner broke. And I agree with Mike. I think uh, with the with that happening, Dunn had to, kind of, had to go. Like, I don't know why you're taking back and sitting through a 56-3 and three middle half game over. Like, the final quarter's in 26, so – you know that's a, that's a very good mare on the front end, but I, I think if he had that one back, had that one over to do over, I think he drives on and and, and goes to the front. But you know, also a point Ray made is um, she got beat on the lead last time, right? So maybe that's part of the reason why they took back. But uh, Warwizinia did her no favors. She stepped to the outside and didn't go anywhere. He had to tip three three wide pretty early uh, on the turn, and that's kind of doomsday too, right? So uh, the way I saw the race, I agree with. Uh, with what most of Mike said. Thomas? <clears throat> uh, there is a couple of things in this race. There, there is, um, we can start with MM Stream. Uh, second time she went uh, with no shoes. She won uh, when she beat Jiggy Jog with no shoes. She went, I'm 99% sure she had shoes when she lost for Fashion Schooner. She went without shoes this time. She, she, she is a better horse with no shoes. Uh, if you go to Yonkers, you can't race with no shoes on Yonkers. It's only Ark. You have tried to do that. Um, Jiggy Jog. I was like, when I was watching the race live, I was like disappointed. But when 25 and 4, what you can expect? Normally she will win. But there is like a, not any bad thing about, about Dexter. I think we praised Dexter so much that after the, when he, after he'd been in Sweden and the Elite Lop, I I can't remember when he won a big race. And Every time before, everything did go good for Dex. But right now, he is on a streak with nothing good happening in the race from when he won the first race this day. It was not him. He he could back up with the, with the pacer to to Aki. He could back up uh, the second half, but he just let him go. And he won. But after that, like Mike said, um, he was very dry. And I saw him today on the Red Mile too. Go fifty six to the half with a, with with a two year old and yeah he hit the wall on the on the home stretch so uh, what can I say MM Stream Sharp Dexter big question mark I I I'm super high on him so so Derek again back to the gambling show discussing gambling next time we see these two match up you have to figure the odds kind of come in together so are you looking for Jiggy Jog to rebound you make excuses for the last two or, or is MM Dream sharper now. Yeah, I would think that Jiggy Jog could rebound. I mean, I don't think uh, she's a lock versus MM Stream, though. MM Stream, listen, she got a soft half, soft three quarters, and she won the race. It's that simple. I think we saw a lingering pattern throughout a lot of these races on the Hamiltonian card where you have a horse on the outside who pushes away a little bit, see the, sees some other horse leaving and just gives up and just goes to the back and tries to race from off the pace. And I, I I don't get it. You know, if you're driving a horse that has a legitimate <clears throat> chance. You, you don't want to put everything to chance. You should go out there and, you know, you know, take the bull by the horn, so to speak. As far as whether MM's dream shows up at Yonkers, you, let's remember that Ron Burke also has its academic. So I would say maybe its academic gets an international call of MM's dream. I don't know for certain. 
So maybe she's in one of the understake, uh, the $250,000 invite. But uh, yes, I would say if I'm betting again next week, I would take the chance that Jiggy Jog will be more aggressively handled. And, uh, you know, to your point, Thomas, Dexter got himself caught in in the two hole today with the at the Red Mile as well. With yeah, the that, 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 yeah, that, that's true. I saw it. Yeah, I saw that he, him, with Art Ferrari J. Uh, there was just a race before uh, Commonwealth. He go fifty six in a piece with a two year old or making a second start. So somebody need to give him a watch. <laughs> <laughs> so we have MM's dream winning the Steel Memorial. Uh, I guess we mentioned that first race enough. So that was Dexter Dunn for trainer Ogus Fonstead. Stonebridge Helios, the very rare pacer in the Ogus Fonstead barn. Uh, race four went to Kilmister there, the Muscle Hill. Race five, the Continental Victory. Tactical Mounds got it done from post 10 for Scott Zeron, a, a, a teaser of, of things to come. But we'll flip next to race six, the New Jersey Cider Stakes final, the two year old Colt and Gelding Trotters and the Thomas Sig Sauer and My Way. They were one two in the betting and they pretty much followed each other around the track, one two. Yeah, it, it was that. The uh, Sig Sauer, I liked him on the first qualifier, Magical. He's been my almost favorite one of the favorite cults in uh in north america and uh yeah andrew mccarthy when he come to the front uh 56 and three to the half i was okay with that i think made my way uh, he tried to go out and try to go in and andrew locked the inside there was a little space on the inside in the beginning and if my way would come out a little before i think my world would beat him but the uh, six hour two good horses first and second not much to talk about after that the Hankins and our first stop it's not his melody but uh, we're going to listen to the two muscle hill called six hour and my way later to this year yeah mike uh, obviously we saw a lot of upsets on, on hamilton day we'll get into some of those but uh pretty formful here yeah the favorites dominated but i, I appreciate that that mccarthy shut that inside off because you yep. see a lot of that you know, all the time that these guys you know kind of you know, give that lane there. He did not. He definitely came over and, and shut that down. And that was that was huge if you have a horse like that. I mean, that's the kind of stuff I, I want to see. I, I, you know, these guys really going for it. The big money's on the line. You know, they're not letting holes. They're they're taking away the, the rail, things like that. And, and legally, not, not anything, you know, wrong with that. That's what you want to see. So uh, I, I noticed that right away. And I thought the one was actually pretty good in the race. I mean, Considering he was up against two pretty nice ones, uh, that I know Derek liked that horse. I thought that horse raced pretty good. Derek, yeah, I thought he raced okay, Hank and Tanover. I mean, if, if since you keep pointing out this is a betting show, you know what I find, <laughs> what I take away from this race was Mars Hill, who looked comatose the entire race, and then somehow in deep stretch, like hit another gear, and to me was really motoring home really strong. Might be a horse to watch going forward, maybe an equipment change or something, or, you know, keep him a little bit more interested early or a better spot on the st starting gate where he can be a little bit more involved early. But I, that's what I took away from this race, other than the winners being good, is that Mars Hill kind of showed some late interest in the mile. You know, that's the one I liked in that race, Derek, and I don't remember exactly seeing that, but maybe I just kind of given up by the time we got to the stretch. So I might have to catch that replay. I do see the 28-2 last quarter. It was uh, – a one of the faster ones in there, so I have to go catch that. But uh, Ray, yeah, no, <laughs> this race kind of captures a lot of things we've already talked about. For one, you have a horse like Mars Hill, who, if I remember correctly, he was two for two going into that race. Right. Um, and we we saw this later on the card. But what Derek was saying is, just you have horses that are drawn outside and they just don't go anywhere. They just kind of waited for things to happen. Granted, worked tremendously for others much later on the card but uh same time the track at this point seemed to be playing as we would expect it to on hambletonian day six hour went to the front um as mike mentioned too the the big key to that race was the stretch drive uh when andy mccarthy's horse started kind of veering as two-year-olds will tend to when they start accelerating and then he was able to shut that hole down just in the right time where Tietrick then had to kind of take back and make my way go, which for my way to be able to re-rally like that, at least to me, is eye-catching, but it's eye-catching to everybody else, especially he was second in the New Jersey Sire Stakes no matter what. So even if they don't qualitatively look at that, quantitatively speaking, my way is coming out of the race in good form. 
Uh, Dave Miller, I also noticed, had a real firm grip on Hankins' hand over the whole way. I don't think – did he show that horse the stick at all? That looked like a hand drive pretty much the entire way. Maybe like a couple taps into the stretch before he just kind of leveled off. Um, so the top three are obviously going to be ones to watch through the season. Um, but th- this race really – I think, if I remember correctly, this was the race before the track really kind of started to go weird. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. I would agree with that, Ray. But uh, Garnett, thoughts on this race, Dad? I bent my way, and he couldn't get out. Uh, good, great drive by Andrew McCarthy, not only shutting off the inside, but keeping Hankins Hanover live enough that uh, the outside wasn't an option until it was too late. Really good drive by McCarthy, uh, much to my chagrin. <laughs> So race seven, the Lady Liberty. Uh, uh, Derek, we got a lot to unpack here. Uh, Grace Hill starts the year undefeated. She suffered defeat several times now at the hands of Silver Label a couple times. Michaela once. They finish one two in this race. Test the Faith finally gets away from post ten and actually goes off as the seven to five favorite in this race. And uh, again, it is Silver Label getting it done. Michaela second, and obviously as Ray alluded to. We'll start to maybe talk a little bias as, as we get into this card later. All of a sudden, they were 6th and 7th at the quarter, and they finished 1-2 at the line. I'm not buying the whole bias you know, thing that everyone's throwing out here. I mean, if you go back and look at the card as a whole, I think the majority of horses that won were you know, third or better you know, by the three-quarter pole. It's not like horses were coming from 10th every single race. You know, do I think that more horses won from off the pace than perhaps on a, on a typical day? Yes, but I, I really didn't think the track was that biased. The good horses that went to the lead, you know, did well, um, in my opinion. And the ones that didn't do well weren't very good on this particular day. Um, I think this particular division, what you're seeing is Grace Hill wasn't as good as we, you know, as I wouldn't say wasn't as good. Let me change that. She's not as dominant as she appeared to be early in the year. It's a very close division. Silver Label, Michaela, Grace Hill, Test of Faith, I would imagine at some point will join them in that group. You know, it's there's a number of good top older pacing mares, and that's good for competition. It's good for betting races. Ray, uh, don't don't let us down now. It sounded like you were going to take the opposite stance. Are you going to make the case for this bias? So, well, here here's the thing. It's more so that... On Hamiltonian Day, traditionally, we see it play fairly formfully towards the front, even if it goes absurdly fast. Horses on the front have still held on. You could attribute that to those horses still being good horses that hold on the lead, Uh, whatever you want to say. It was nonetheless, there was a stark transition, at the very least in my head uh, and from on paper, from things going kind of logical to things almost starting to feel more like if you were getting incredibly creative that you were getting rewarded not necessarily to say that that's illogical but uh, there there were there was a start there was a starkly different approach i felt you had to make um basically on the back half of this card uh, i we were talking about the lady liberty on the round table and i i consensus wise i don't think any of us knew how the pace was going to unfold on this race and then it played exactly like that uh, especially max contract deciding today's the day to go to the lead and then get shuffled. Same thing with Boudoir Hanover, fired out, got shuffled. Kobe's GG uh, made that mid-race move for some reason. They went 119 to three quarters. This race reasonably fell apart. There are other races later we could talk about why they were much weirder in terms of trying to figure out track switching, so on and so forth. Uh, but but that, that said, Silver Label came when everyone was tiring. Uh, she had... She, she did pretty much the same thing in the perfect sting, except I would say a little bit more impressive because she wasn't moving into a breather. She was moving through fast fractions the entire time along the rim uh, to just hold off Michaela there. Uh, but the, the, the deck of the thing Derek said, it's going to be an open division. I'm sure test of faith when she doesn't have to go first over through a 53 and one half is going to be much more competitive, especially when she gets a couple more starts under her belt. And you're going to see probably four or five different horses butting heads. So, Thomas, obviously the trip didn't work out for Test of Faith, but from a gambling perspective, gets away from post 10, but given the two starts we've seen, could you have seen her as the 7-5 to five favorite in this race? I think he's frozen. I guess Mike. that's a no. <laughs> Mike, will ask that to you instead. He's Mike, thinking, what do you think? He's thinking about it. <laughs> well, 7-5 to five I thought was a little bit low, but we talked about her on the, the, yeah, uh, the pre-show. Not- 
this is somebody talking to me. It's bad connection. I think there is some storm around my. Yeah, you know what? Ray and I got that storm earlier, so we will hopefully keep Thomas so do, around. Do you want me to go, or what do you want me to do here? No, you can stay, Mike. We don't want you. To <laughs> Thomas, we good now? We have you? <laughs> yeah, I think I'm okay now. And I like Silver Label. I think it was a uh, top performance, but Silver Label. It's nobody could see the scenario that Brian Sears was gonna jam to the 53 and one and retake uh, into the last turn. So. Uh, it's all about uh, trips, uh, pace, and everything in uh, in uh, the pacing fillies. But Silver Label, I'm I need to be more high on her than I've been this year. Uh, test of Fate, okay, she got a little rough trip, but uh, I'm not sure if she never gonna be back to the the best we saw of Test of Fate. I think she is starting to get a little tired. Max Contract, I think I'm finished having her on my ticket. Um, yeah, I don't. I, I'm just super impressed by Silver Label because she needed, she did some work. So I'm impressed with Silver Label. All right, Mike, we'll finish that thought for you. So seven to five, a little short on Test of Faith. Yeah, I mean there was a couple things going on there. I mean, for one, you know, she's former Horse of the Year. She got a lot. She gets a lot of buzz. She was moving inside. Those two bad posts, two bad trips. She was five to one morning line, which. Everybody's going to look at that and say, oh, we got to get on in this, you know, so that's another thing. And and we did talk that the odds might be a little jumbled, uh, you know, Silver Label four to one, Michaela four to one, Grace Hill three to one, uh, Test of Faith seven to five. So you had four horses under five to one in the race that, you know, pretty much and, and they finished in the top five. Uh, I, I'm not crazy about Test of Faith, though. I just I don't she used to be an absolute stone cold killer and it wouldn't matter what trip she got. Well, now she almost has to have everything set up and, and um, it's just not right now. And she's not what she was and that's fine. Uh, and silver label is very good. The fact that she's here tells you all you need to know, because this is the first, I mean, she shipped down here for three races this year that she was in Canada for her entire career prior to that. So now that they're hitting the road, they know that they, what they have with her, uh, she's really good right now. I mean, she's, and, and I think Zeron fits her very well also. So uh, he, he drove really, I mean, he was awesome. I thought all day. I mean, he was really doing a lot of great things. He really proved how much I think his, his rise. And I think he's one of the best there is, but he just, on these bigger days, he's getting better and better and better. And he's putting horses in the right places and it doesn't matter their price. It doesn't matter the post he's getting it done. So that's my opinion. I have something to add there with Scott Seron. I, I agree very much with you say, Mike, it's like, I'm a good friend with Scotty and the, the good thing I can say about Scotty, take care of a horse when you start the season, baby racing, or if you start qualifying them. He is not an emotional guy. Like, he don't take, if you lose one race, he don't take the race with him into the next race. Some of the other big guns, so who is, like, very emotional, if they are not good in a, in a big race, then they are keeping that same, the rest of the card. So... I'm so happy for Scott Seron, uh, and like Mike said, he is one of the best we have. Garnett, I saw you studying the program there. You got a good fact for us? Yeah, you know, one of the things that I liked in the preview show was her recency, that she had a very, very good tightener last week, or the week before at Mohawk, where she was only used until the, she wasn't used at all until the final quarter, but she came home in 26 and won in 48 and a piece. And, uh, you know, I think that paid off in this case. She was very strong. She made that big first over move, paced about a 26 and one third quarter. And, you know, at the eighth pole, it was it was very evident she was not getting caught. I thought Michaela was really good where she came from, but she was never she was never catching her. And another fun fact about this race was that um, I really like Silver Label and I never got a bet in because I was being interviewed by Jessica Otten uh, on the set. And I totally forgot that when the interview ends the gates rolling so um if i remembered that like i should have i could have at least bet through my adw with my phone but i didn't even have enough time to log in or anything so that was somewhat typical of how my wagering day went at least till later in the card but um you know she's you know she, she did get a you know a decent trip too because i think some of the horses were used up early but once she made that big move uh, i don't think there was much doubt who was going to win the race so she was good We'll next turn our attention to race eight, the uh, Sam McKee Memorial. They split in two divisions there. So this was the first of those two. And uh, Mike, Allie Wag's back. 
Well, I mean, Ali White can can win off a perfect trip. I'll give him that. I, I really liked Luz Perlman in this race, and and he was really good. And and so we talked about the, how the track had changed, and I think Ray is correct. Uh, the track started to change races seven through twelve, and this is a, a, another point where you have Luz Perlman that was that was dead last and came flying for second. Now he didn't win the race. I mean, Ali White got a perfect trip and was able to win. But then, you know, that led to a lot of closers. Race 9, a closer won. Race 10, a closer won from dead last. Race 11, a closer won from dead last. So a lot of horses coming from dead last, which is nearly impossible to do to finish 1-2. It does not happen very often. Well, it started to happen in the middle of this card. So that's, I think, why people are looking at bias and things. As far as Ali Wag being back, I mean, a couple things happened there. Russo's handover was just like dropped an anchor around the turn. And that was, you know, Southwind Gendry never fired at all. I thought Backstreet Shadow was just okay. And Ali Wag had Stone Cold Perfect and won the race. I mean, I don't know. I don't want anybody out of this race personally. So, Thomas, I mean, I guess in hindsight, maybe the public kind of bet this race correctly because I'm not sure who else was in the field in hindsight. But Ruthless Handover at three to five from post eight seemed a little short. Yeah, it was too short. We, we we did talk about him when we had the discussion that uh, I'm I'm high on rootless uh, when there is value on him and and he is always so so brave when he can open up with a couple of lengths. This time he never got to open up. He he needed to work hard to get to the front and he had a horse outside straight away and he was beat when they come come home. So Aliwag a perfect trip for him. Little disappointed on I did it my way. Um, Southwind Gendry got over bet and he was never into the win. And Luce Perlman was flying home. Backstreet Shadow did a very, very impressive performance. But Aliwag, when he got a trip like that, you need you need to to fool the little old guy. To to he's not like he was for uh, one and a half year ago, but he can still win a race in 47 and two. We can also say a little about the track on Meadowlands. It was a little windy. And there was like little human, so it was where the track got little too loose. Uh, especially the guys I talked with when I saw the track, because they had had problems to get enough water on it. When when there was little wind to it, dried up so fast, so the track was little too loose, special for the Scandinavian guys. Garnett. Yeah, I mean, I, I tried Southwind Gendry in this race. He was he was not very good at all. But I wasn't a bit surprised by Ruthless's Ruthless Hanover's performance. I told you that last week that, um, you know, he went rough and broke at the wire when, when uh, I don't remember the name of the horse that Harris Philly just breathed on him. And it's like Thomas says, he needs to be he needs to be open lengths in front to get brave. And you could kind of see most of this race that Ali Wag was sitting there waiting and. Um, like Mike said, he got the perfect trip and got the job done. But, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, Ali White, is he back? I don't know. I mean, if the same group of horses shows up next week, he'll probably win again. Probably, you know, uh, there's, there's not, none of them are that great. At least they weren't on Saturday. But uh, was Ruthless Hanover over bet? Absolutely. All right, Ray. Mike said he didn't want anybody out of this race. Come on, I know you've got a good thirty to forty to one shot. You'll want to want to bet next time out of this race. Come on. I, I mean, the thing that I'm trying to think about first things with Lewis Perlman. If the chart's correct, he went like a fifty-two and four back half, which either I don't think that highly of Lewis Perlman, or like maybe that there, there is something to say that there he's might be a million bucks. I mean, you know. I, I don't think he's 52 and four fast though, from my memory. And I okay, can very well, least we, we're not going to question Meadowlands charter, Kelly Petaskey's chart. That is the gold standard. And that is correct. Ray. So 52 and four. I, I, but that, that's my point is that I, I take it for its word. And so if anything, that could be a sign that a horse like Lewis Perlman is progressing forward. I didn't mention backstreet shadow at all on the round table because he had just raced on August 1st. And there was a part of me going, are they really going to bring this horse back four days later? Like, do we still do that in 2023? And I guess the answer is yes. And I, I texted you and Mike, I think, uh, or I, I texted someone else as they were scoring down a backstreet shadow looked like the sit, like the horse we saw in the Borgata series. I, he was perked up. He was moving over good. the ground. And I don't think that third place finish is necessarily terrible because for one, he had raced four days prior. He was in against now hours of twenties, now hours of tens. He's clearly on the comeback. Uh, if I remember correctly too, I talked to Travis Alexander a couple of months ago and he told me the horse had some kind of issue that they were, that they were working through. Um, it was before the battle of Lake Erie. And so this horse has just been a project ever since then. And 
for him to go that 47 and four mile, I'd absolutely keep my eyes on him wherever he shows up again, especially if it's on the big track, uh, just because he's always been that kind of speed freak who can pace out of his skin. Um, aside from that, what Thomas was saying about the loose track, I was trying to think of how to evaluate uh, ruthless Hanover then, because on one hand, his best day was at Harris, Philadelphia, when they won 146 and three. And to my understanding, that was a tarmac that they were racing on for them to go that fast. Um, but then he went that 46 and four mile on uh, in the Dave Brower Memorial. And then he won the Houghton right on pace night. If I if I'm if I'm remembering correctly, because if That's I'm correct, yeah, he went. Okay. No, yeah. he won the day. Wait, did he win that? No, one? he did not. No, oh, he, not, yeah. oh, okay. Okay. Cause oh, Char Charlie may Ray. Come on. Oh, like staring oh, at you. I should, I should remember who what, Don's going to be very upset. I'm, with I me. love, I love this every time it gets brought up because it's just, <laughs> but, but there, but then there's a, there's a better point to be said there where maybe with ruthless Hanover, he, if the track got loose and he's showing his best <clears throat> efforts are on harder surfaces, maybe we don't look at it as a regression because a lot of times you'll see even these really good horses. If there's just a little inconsistency in like the ground or something like that, that can make them lose like a fifth of a second, four fifths of a second, a whole second and a half. It depends on horse to horse. Fifth and and he had to, seconds. and he, well, he had to go that big first quarter, three wide to get to the lead. And then, was holding that speed to go 120 and two. I imagine that 120 and two a bit more taxing on a looser track. So may, may, maybe Ruth, maybe we can give Ruthless Hanover a little bit of a break as well. Um, but I'm definitely keeping an eye on Backstreet Shadow and maybe Lewis Perlman's going. Maybe he's progressing. At how old is he? Is he six? Is he seven? Was he sitting on the bias? Wasn't he? Oh, he's fine. That's Who was? You have to ask yourself. <laughs> oh, who's? Was yeah. No, it, it's a valid question. I don't have an answer. I okay. but it, but when we handicap these things and. It, we have to remember what the conditions were where we see this line on August 5th. Not only are we seeing that like Lewis Perlman was second, but we remember, well, on that card, there were a bunch of other closers. We're just, we're continuously learning about these races well into the future with every single race that goes. But so, I will say one thing is, is, is if you find, if you have a bias that you think is an actual bias, then you want to bet against horses that were on the bias and bet horses that were against it. I mean, that is the whole purpose of it. To me, it's to understand how the races unfold, because the more you understand how the races unfolded, the more you understand the horses and the more you understand the horses, the more you can see maybe they fall into another bias that could be developing. So it's more so it's more so a tool versus an indicator to me. How about this? Bias yeah, Derek, or no bias? <laughs> I don't care if there was a bias or if there wasn't a bias. What I do think is that Bruce Perlman, unless he's in a spot where he's against a really good horse next time, He's a complete bet against as far as I'm concerned. Everyone watched him storm home full of pace, and they're all going to be all over him. And he's going to be bet like, ridiculously heavy to the point where he shouldn't be. He's going to be much lower odds than he should be in the race, you know, like I said, unless he's going against a really good horse. And to me, he's a bet against now. Uh, to me, Ali Wake Hanover turned in this performance that he turned in. Granted, it was a really good trip and everything worked out nicely. Was a horse, was a performance that made me think that. I would consider betting him next time now. I wasn't really high on him going into this. He proved me wrong with a strong performance, and now I would consider betting him forward. I'm really not that much interested in Luz Perma. Well, Love by the Masses takes out the Vincennes preferred in race nine, which takes us to race 10, a little bit earlier spot on the card than usual for the Hamiltonian Oaks, race number 10, the 98 Hamiltonian Oaks, the three-year-old Philly Trotters going for a half a million dollars. Thomas, Marcus Melander, Tim Tietrick. Tim Tietrick, a second consecutive Hamiltonian Oaks and a second consecutive Hamiltonian Oaks from post 10. Thomas, you and I were there at the uh, post draw, and uh, Marcus wasn't too thrilled with that post 8, post 9, post 10 draw for his three, but probably happier on this Monday evening. Yeah, uh, like when you go back and watch the replay, like how did Heaven Hanover won, won the Oaks? I can't still understand it because when you go back and watch the replay she was uh kayla asked the other milan the horse was gapping into the last turn so uh she need to go buy that one and uh it, it 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 looks like they were flying home but it was also the horses in the lead after the 53 and two half starting to to get some trouble in the front there and when they come home in the home stretch I was sure we was going to get a Canadian win with the writer's resolve from 
Matt Bax, and uh, then Secret Wolo come, then Aki come with the uh, pull down bridle and bond was also a pull down bridle and no shoes on Heaven Hanover. So um, I don't know what to say, just to say Heaven Hanover, she won the Oaks, Walna Payton. Yeah, it was uh, not Dexter Dunn's day. She was just terrible. Heart on fire back. I didn't believe in her anything in the elimination when everything opened up and I didn't believe her in the final. Instagram model, I don't think she raced. I think she raced much better than the fifth place set. She was parked the whole way. She got a little... Uh, cover uh, through the last turn and I think it was okay really something was yeah when she got the blinkers on she was poof she was gone she was almost like Bon last week so uh, Bon with the get away from the close bridle with a pull down bridle she was um, better uh, it's not like I'm super high on anybody in the Oaks they win the Oaks in 50 and 3 it was more the 53 half uh, we're going to discuss Hey, Thomas, you said that Rayleigh some I th so I did they take the shoes off Rayleigh something too and then add blinkers also or did they just add yeah. blinkers? I think it was I think it was no shoes on her and and blinkers on her. Uh, okay, that that makes a bit more sense because I like, I mean Rayleigh you see with the standard bread them react to blinkers the same way a thoroughbred does where the moment they get them on it's just What was she doing favorite in the race though? That was the yeah, other yeah, she, she way over bet. I she mean, clicked out at 9 to bet. 5. It was ridiculous. The, the moment that she got to the lead, um, she was nine to five because before that it was, was Walner Payton the slight favorite at that point when they were going to the gate? Yes, I believe I was commenting that the morning line was perfect and then all of a sudden that <laughs> late flip. But you know what? I expected it though because you looked at Will Pace, it was going to happen. So oh. It definitely came in correctly. But um, uh, well, Ray, at this point, uh, your thoughts on the Oaks? Yeah, so I saw the 26 second first quarter. James McDonald getting the pocket. Righteous Resolve was my stand in that race, and I was salivating. And then I saw the 53 half, and I went, "Why? Why?" Because <laughs> like, because legit, had they gone maybe 54 seconds to the half, I think Righteous Resolve wins that race. I just I don't know. I'm amazed that back to back weeks these trotting fillies, different trotting fillies, but just the sophomore trotting fillies in general were that ridiculously fast. And Righteous Resolve, the victim both times uh heaven hanover you could you could see into the turn she had a much more stout rally uh than she did in the del miller memorial when they were starting to kind of come back to horses she was just motoring and she's she trots through turns incredibly well uh i don't uh, maybe others can disagree but i feel like maybe she would probably do okay on smaller tracks if that's just if she can go around the big turn like that i i feel like she might be able to handle some tighter turns but i'm not you know watching with as keen an eye uh but she she was she had the most furious rally of everybody and she's always had that she's always been one that through the straightaways she just keeps charging keeps going and that won her the race um bond they did try to race her from off the speed and she responded just got out kicked by a horse that had a bit of fresher legs and whatever bigger heart who, how how else can you really describe it beyond just what you see on the lines uh, but I, I was in the same boat as Thomas at the eighth pole. I was like, I, I got like two grand in tickets ready to cash. And then the wall came down. If it was, if it wasn't a horse racing moment for me, it's amazing. I'm here right now. I, I should have quit that day. I should have walked away. I shouldn't be here right now, but I'm still here after righteous resolve loss. Hey, speaking of being here, Garnett's back with us. Garnett, the Oaks. <laughs> I bet Seeger Volo. I thought it was a winner turning for home. But um, listen, I, I respect everything Thomas says, and he's he's very bright, and he tells us all about this race had nothing to do with equipment changes. The race fell apart. They came home in twenty nine. The horse that was last was live. She passed everybody. It's very. It's just as simple as that. So Derek, uh, well, speaking of equipment changes, I, I guess Garnett's going to discount him. But did we hear anything? Have we heard anything beyond like, discussing it all, all the way this race went and the way this horse ended up on the lead in, in the half that we did? I didn't speak to him about it. I mean, you, what I found interesting is if you look later in the, the card when uh, he won with by the missile, he didn't seem that happy. I mean, it wasn't the best day for Yannick, but let's be honest. Uh, unfortunately, I mean, he had a stakes win late, but uh, didn't probably go the way he thought. Uh, as far as the Oaks, I agree with what Gonard said. They went really, really fast. The race fell apart and these horses closed. I think you give some credit to Bond for rebounding with a, with a strong effort doing something she hadn't been doing before. 
Heaven Hanover was simply better. Righteous Resolve raced well again. Secret Vola does what she does every week. She's right there every single week. You know, she's got a, a big engine. She she can last a long time, but she doesn't have that, that, that high speed that maybe you need to sprint past some of these horses late. You know, she just doesn't seem to possess that, you know, but maybe that's something that will make her a really good older man uh, as the years go along. I think Sears had every intention of going to the front, but he couldn't. Once once he got to the once he was heading for the quarter and they're going twenty six, he he had no no choice but to tuck in. But I really think he wanted the front in that race, and then it just kind of you know it went the way it went. But I thought you know when they started to back up on the turn and she was in the three hole, I thought she was going to win. But anybody that was close to that fifty three and two half couldn't win. It's worth noting for anyone who's watching this if if you have two screens uh, on CBS Sports Network right now is the replay show of the Hamiltonian Oaks and the Hamiltonian. They just had the Oaks, so maybe we'll be up to the Hamiltonian when they get there. <laughs> uh, so, Mike, I, from at least a, a pick standpoint, the Oaks, I, I like really something to rebound. Obviously, I saw the 53 half, didn't feel so great about it. And then turning for home, watching the race, I would be in the camp, too. I thought Righteous Resolve, off of that pocket trip, was, was going to get there for J-Mac. But, uh, yeah, you know, the setup worked out well, having Hanover Bond from nearly last to 1-2 at the line. Well. I mean, I, I saw the race that it was going to – now it kind of played a little different than I thought. I thought Bond would be up close again. He, you know, she wasn't. I thought that she really, really rebounded. She's really a good horse. To, to be able to do what she's done and, and, and to come back and almost win this race the way she almost won it, I thought really showed a lot. But the race figured to set up for closers, just the way that these, you know, Phillies have been going at each other. And, and here we are, another 53 half. I liked Instagram model. I, you know, she didn't have the best trip. She wasn't winning anyway, just the way she was. But I, I, I did think that secret Volo and heaven Hanover had shots. I mean, I was seven, nine, 10 on all my tickets. That's, you know, and, and I thought 28 to one was a fantastic price on a horse that had a chance to get a set up with a driver that knows how to, to win this race. And, and he drove perfect in the race. I mean, he did what he had to do. I mean, he got a perfect set up for him, but you know, he didn't use the horse until it was time. She exploded the last 16th. I mean, she was coming late. She was, I thought she was really good. And coming down the, the, the backside, I thought Ray was going to be really smart with righteous result, but she just doesn't really seem to want to pass that last horse right now. And that's something that I think you need to be concerned about because she's going to be bet going forward off this. And I, I don't know. I mean, a little starch taken out of her, but it just seems to me she doesn't want to maybe pass that last horse. She might be better on the front herself. Uh, like she used to be able to get up at Woodbine. I, I don't know. I, I, I thought it was a good race. I, I thought the race figured to set up the way it did. And you got the biggest price. Uh, it's just too bad I couldn't capitalize it on with the Maltese and things like that. But, uh, you know, if you paid attention and you watch these horses, this the, the result really isn't that that strange. I, th I thought it was interesting, too, since you say that, Mike, um, watching Righteous Resolve race um, and remembering her as a two-year-old. Uh, her, her and Southwind Cores, the Bax's other horse in the handbook, they, they kind of look similar in how they move. They're both kind of luggers uh, who, who stay low and just they're more grindy in that way. And right, that's probably the Righteous Resolve's detriment the same way it is Southwind Cores to a degree because you know she she was downing rarely something. But after going a mile like that, once she had that one away, she couldn't handle all the other momentum that was coming at her. Uh, so. I'd be more curious how how does a Philly who tracks back to back fifty three front halves rebound at all? <laughs> I I think I think she is as good as some of the top trotting Phillies in the division. But you're probably right; she's probably better at sitting forward at that point. She's not going to be coming from second over third over like Evan Hanover can, like Bond can. But you put her and you put her up close with the kind of gate speed she has. I, I imagine she's probably going to be a factor. And I guess like the elegant image is later this year. I'm trying to think of what other stakes, uh, maybe even breeders. Crown. She's just what been else? unlucky. She's just been, yeah. unlucky. she, she was able to keep up in a fast pace twice. She never lost any ground really in the stretch. She's just been unlucky to have to be stuck in two fast paces. If it, these two races didn't go 53, if they would have went 54 and four and one twenty three, she might've won those races. The other thing is she, she, she did the starch out of her. She did pass the horses she needed to pass. You can't say she didn't pass the last horse. She got past herself. No, that's what I was saying. By yeah, the only she, two horses yeah, that, I, had, I don't know. that I mean, had live legs down. at the end of the yeah. mile. She seems I, to I, hang just a little I, bit for me. Just a little bit. Yeah, maybe. But, I mean, I stand with anybody that was close to that pace couldn't win. And she and she won the race within the race because she was the one that was that was finished closest to the, to the winner that was in that early pace. So, 
I don't know. I, I get, I, I tend to lean more to give her a bit of a break, but we'll see. I mean, listen, going forward, you know, like any other races, it all depends on price, what we're going to do. Mm-hmm. Oh, my two notes are, uh, congratulations, Tram Marcus Melander, driver Tim Tetrick, Kevin Hanover, Tim Tetrick again, two consecutive Hamiltonian Oaks from post 10. Different tactics, faster schooner blasting off last year from the outside post for trainer Jim Campbell. Uh, this year, having Hanover, of course, from well off of the pace. And in terms of betting horses back, yeah, you know, I thought Bond got some fairly nice setups just kind of loping along with the lead. Some of those first starts of the year. Wasn't quite sure what to think of her. She got that pressure, defeated three back. Obviously, was pretty uncontrollable in the lead the last time out in the limb. But this effort, you know, I, I think I think of her a little bit higher now than I might have uh, after the last couple of starts. So uh, Bond uh, might be on my, my radar to watch. But uh, the John Cashman Memorial, the open trot, race 11. Uh, I need to go grab a drink. So Ray Catolo can definitely fill some time talking about it's academic. Our spirit of Massachusetts trot winner at Plain Ridge Park wins the Cashman. Yeah, my, my spirits were starting to dwindle at this. I wish I could have broken out some spirits if I was much of a consumer at this point. I had... I had a lot of hopes riding on Venerate. I was getting an okay price at seven to two, uh, but you know we're betting against its academic, who or at least I was betting against its academic, who has been good, has shown no reason why he shouldn't be good, and was good again. He just he went by Venerate, who got a little lazy when when forced to accelerate in the stretch, and its academic, he's always charging, he's always going, and that won him the race by a nose. Uh, I, I think the biggest shock to me was when the odds first opened, South Quintirian was around eight to one. And then he was another one of these final flash favorites that came out. He went the favorite in that race to make when I saw it's academic was five to two. I went, I should have just bet it's academic. I thought he was going to go down to like eight to five and st- said it's academics five to two. And that's a pretty good price to get on him. Yeah, Thomas, uh, what about the betting here? Southland, Tyrion at 2-1. to one. Astro, we knew, take some money. Venerate, it's academic, taking money. But Southland, Tyrion, the favorite. That was, that was interesting to me. Yeah, but the people who bet Asteroid, like, if you go take the betters in France where they bet the most money in, in the harness racing and in Sweden, if they have seen the post parade of Asteroid, you wouldn't go to the window. He was uh, lame, sore in the, in the, warm, in the post parade. So uh, that he made a break in the last turn, that was like same thing as getting mail every day. So, um, so to Tyron, I know it was uh, because he went to 50 miles the week before. We know hockey always get bet uh, uh, on Meadowlands on the big days. Um, I was high on Vendere. I had a, uh, uh, a decent win bet on him. So, But I had a feeling straight away when they passed the finish line, it's academic horse to horse. He is, have to be one of the nicest horses to drive and, and own. He, he he close bridle. You can drive him as a car, leave, take him back. He never get grabby. I'm just impressed. But it's like, I'm not, I don't know what to say. I, I've been waiting for Rattle my cage, but I don't think he's going to win a race this year because he is always up there, but he don't want to win. So it's not so much more to say. It's a little weak open throttle. We have in uh, a larger one is coming back, but uh, we don't have the the top guns that we had for uh, for some years ago. Garnett, I bet rattle my cage. I love the drive I got. Um, I thought I was pretty looking pretty good at the three quarters. I'm, I don't know that he's not going to win a race. I don't think he, he's probably not going to win a race against these horses. I just don't think he's good enough right now. But um, to me, the top two were were outstanding. Um, that was a great race, a great, uh, a great finish. And, you know, they were out a long way. They're both three wide at the three quarters. Um, I don't know. I just think, think the top two horses in that race were really good. Um, and, uh, you know, you could, they're probably very evenly matched right now, but it's, it's academic might be a little bit better, but maybe he won cause he had the cover. He had the venerates cover, right. Um, to me, that was kind of the story of the race, just how good those two were. Mike. Well, I think that Thomas put Asteroid in that race so he could get in the way of Juju B personally. I don't know. Because <laughs> <laughs> I thought that that horse actually raced pretty good in that race. And he, I don't know, he looked live pretty well. I mean, he wasn't gonna, probably going to win, but he did race better than some people thought he would. Uh, but I, I, gave, I, did give, I did give you Carl. I know, I know, I know. I was surprised he took back, Mike. <laughs> I was too, but he looked live. I mean, and then, you know, the three like, kind of, you know, basically 
shit in his face and then that happened and <laughs> he just kind of but he still went forward after that even and and so I don't know, but I thought the sixth race pretty well too, considering that he kind of had the weight to take before he got room in the stretch. And he actually looked a winner about three quarters of the way down the stretch. And then the other two kind of overwhelmed, but it's academic just keeps finding ways to win. I, I loved this horse last year and he got you really did. good at the end of the year, if you recall. Uh, but now all the good ones are gone and he's, he's the one. And, uh, you know, you, you keep getting paid if you like him. I mean, he's never really, you know, major chalk or, two to five ever. I mean, if you like them, you know, you're getting paid. Uh, I don't know. I was sort of against them just because of the post and I liked others. And of course he blew my tickets away and I don't know why I've gotten off them this year, but it is what it is. All right, Derek, uh, a random plug. In fact, on, on a, on a uh, longer shot in this race, delayed Hanover picked up Yannick this week around. So uh, first of all, for trainer Kevin McDermott, of course, his daughter Merritt McDermott, organizing that um, big match race coming up less than two weeks away up at Saratoga. Uh, Harness will get to see jockey Flavian Pratt against Brett Beckwith. It would be an exciting evening after the uh, Alabama that day, right? Yeah, Alabama. Alabama day over at Saratoga. Yeah, why Why do I know the answer? I don't know. You're usually the one that knows this kind of stuff. I know. Uh, so good evening over there. Oh, should be an exciting watch there. But, Derek, the late handover, here's the fact. Dexter Dunn has driven the horse twice in a row this year. That's the only person to have seen this thing twice this year in a row. Yannick dropped start one, then Scott Zeron. Dexter Dunn, Dexter Dunn, there's the two. Scott Zeron, Sean Gray, Jordan Stratton, Scott Zeron, Jordan Stratton, Jay Randall, David Miller, Yannick Jingra, Jay Randall, Bruce Ranger, Andy Miller, Yannick Jingra. Useless fact. I think that the late Hanover would do very well racing in the opens at a track somewhere week after week, and he probably – you know, it's a little over his head against these horses right now. Um, maybe that'll change in the future, but right now that's the way I see it. I, my takeaway from the race is Southwind Tyrion proved that he can go with these, I think. Uh, I think it's academic, you know, continues to amaze and can do good things. And you know what? I, I'd be interested to see if it's academic elects to try to go to Europe because his racing style, being able to take the air and keep going might suit nicely over there, Thomas. Yeah, he will be uh, one of the American horses who will benefit very much on special. I think he will benefit also a mile and a half or something like that. And you can use him. I, he's, he's just a professional. So he will be perfect uh, overseas. Race 12 was the Hamiltonian final. The three-year-old open trot. A million dollars on the line. Garnett, I'm going to start with you because I'm going to use a fact from one of the Clyde Hurt Journalism Workshop students, one of the articles they wrote, Tactical Approach, the first Hamiltonian winner from post 10. Saved me having to look that up. Uh, did it from off of the pace there. Scott Zeron for trainer Nancy Tactor. Uh, Garnett, tell us about the race. But before we start there, uh, uh, give us the plug for the Clyde Hurt Journalism Workshop. Uh, you and I both helped out with that this year, obviously. I uh, saw uh, Manhattan with them, as well as Giants training camp. Obviously, a lot of great racing this weekend. Uh, and three great students once again this year that wrote some excellent stories regarding the Hamiltonian after knowing nothing about harness racing when we met them uh, last Tuesday. Yeah, it's such a fast-paced, um, action-packed workshop. We uh, on, the, on the first day, we take we took them to Ray Snickers, uh, Ray Snickers stable at, at the story track in Goshen. They had no idea why we were going there, really. They thought they were doing a barn, barn tour. And when we got there and we walked over to the barn, I said, okay, who's first? And their eyes were like, to do what? Um, so they got to go into the double jogger and they actually got to handle the lines, which was really cool. Um, and then, you know, um, we jammed so much into like four days that um, on Saturday they got in the van and said, happy Hambo day. And they're like, yeah, yeah happy Hambo day. But <laughs> it was a very, very successful um successful workshop you know my, my son nick did a lot of work on it um teaching them uh you know we're watching a lot of races and kind of teaching the terminology and where everybody's positioned and what we call it in the pocket second over first over don't say a horse ran unless it's off stride um teaching about the second tier and then how to read a program how to bet made a few bets and, but most importantly they got their stories published and um what was really cool was the one in the trentonian was a story accompanied by one of the students' picture that she took of the finish from the infield. So we had both students in, you know, contributing to one story. Um, and, it, you know, it was, it was just a great week, a, a lot of fun. But uh, getting to the race, um, sorry, I, I, 
I should thank both sponsors, Ushua and the Hamiltonian Society. Getting to the race, I, I think I might have been the guy that said I wouldn't be a bit surprised if a cool Papa Bell trip won this year, and it kind of did, right? Except for the fact that he didn't move outside in the stretch. He moved inside. Um, I'm a bit surprised. Um, you know, this race, they cut a 56 half. In the Oaks, they went 53-2, and two, and I think we all kind of knew what was going to happen at the half. Here, when they went 56, um, I said out loud, this might be a two-horse race now between the Bambino and O'Well. And um, it wasn't. Uh, you know, tactical approach. Scott Zeron made the choice to stay inside. He got a lot of luck, but he got the job done. And uh, they call him the money man for a reason. Uh, winner's bet had a, had a great trip and probably was affected by the Lasix, the no Lasix, or maybe it's just not that good. I don't know, but um, <laughs> I was disappointed because I thought he was in, in perfect position and, uh, you know, it just didn't work out. But, um, you know, the, the, a 10, 10, uh, parlay on the Oaks and, uh, the Oaks and the Hambo gets you a lot of money, but uh, I don't know, Mike, you should have maybe bet that instead of the pick four. I know, oh. but, uh, you know, um, it was an exciting race. Didn't go the way I thought it would go. I, I didn't, uh, you know, I thought tactical approach had a shot, but it's hard to bet a 10 horse in the Hamiltonian. And I never did it before. That's pretty much my take. I did. We had, a, a, it's just that I mentioned it earlier, the whole not leaving. You have a million dollars on the line and you have a whole bunch of people that just don't want to leave. I, I just don't get it. I mean, yeah. I don't know. I also don't get why, you know, the uh, Southland Coors and French wine were just kind of sitting on the outside. Well, why not go to the rail? Neither one of your horses are considered like, you know, heavy favorites where you, you need to be in that out of flow. You're better off saving some ground. I didn't get that. Um, Brian says aborted his leave. You know, he gave up and they went super slow. Um, I didn't get that. Uh, I, I think my main takeaway from this race is the horse I thought was the best horse going in. Looked like the best horse to me. Oh, well. I mean, he he went the toughest trip. He put in a huge mile. He got beat by a horse that got lucky up the inside. You know, that's what I took away from it. Congrats to the winner. But the horse got really lucky. He got the golden trip of all time. Oh, well, went the best mile. He put in the best effort. Uh, he, he proved to me that he's the best horse race right now of this group. And uh, Celebrity Bambino just had no excuse. I feel bad for Yannick. Because he put the horse in a perfect position. Yannick did everything perfect. He had the horse on the lead in a 56 half, you know, controlling the race. And the horse just came up empty. I I, I think the only thing that went against him, because if I recall, Bambino isn't one that when he gets sized up by a horse coming at him, he really digs in. Um, I that that That's at least to my memory. And once, oh, well put his head in front no matter how fast bambino was it looked like it almost took him mentally a second to reassess what to do and he still did well to hold forth he held off point of perfect when it looked like point of perfect should go by him in the stretch um but yeah it's it, to me what the funny part of it was we were talking about how this race would set up and i here i i was screaming it's a million dollar race how does nobody go and then it's a million dollar race and no one went. <laughs> it, it set up exact it set up the reverse way I thought, where point of perfect got the lead. I thought Bambino would be able to secure the pocket, but it went the more the more logical way, now looking at it in hindsight, Yannick should be on the lead. Point of perfect should be second. That's how it was to the half. And then uh it was one of those Hambletonian day miracles uh, that happened so often. Well, I shouldn't say so often, but it happened time and time again because it's such a quirky little race where uh, tactical approach. He was coming into the race fine. He had raced fine in the elimination. They had been putting him on the lead, as we all were saying, for whatever reason. Even Nancy has said he's much better with a target. He got a target from post 10 and also had the luck of, like Derek said, everyone wanted to be outside. That just Scott was just saying thank you the entire way around. Just add more room to go up the inside, gain more positions, and then another non-existent passing lane winner. Uh, <laughs> a track that doesn't have the passing lane, which always drives me crazy. And one other thing I wanted to mention, and and I was one originally my thought was always that oh well should follow celebrity Bambino. If oh well follows celebrity Bambino as soon as he moves and tries to move to the front. Does Yannick let him go? And if he does let him go, does Owell win? I don't know. Probably. If he make if he lets him go, I think he probably does. 
I so, think Yang Yannick will hang him, hang him. So Thomas, um, obviously you were quite familiar with European racing and uh, obviously the elite lot, but you know, major race over there in terms of picking your posts. Uh, obviously, maybe connections for Celebrity and Bino might not have ideally wanted the rail. Uh, do you think we should change the way we do the post draws for for events like this? Yeah. <clears throat> but it's not just the just the winner. It's more like I'm uh, if if you have it like that that the uh, the winner is is not going to pick position it doesn't matter if you're second third four or fifth in uh, elimination for the hambletonian that race there will go also as a non-betting race in in europe because i think no more about for the exact the three fact and everything it's like it's not fair for the for the betters when when drivers can save the horses to be fifth or be second so i think you should uh, at least uh change that and uh, the horses who finish second or finish first or finish fifth, they need to draw after how to finish. So, and uh, Yannick wouldn't pick post one with Celebrity Bambino. He will pick maybe four or five with the Celebrity Bambino. So, uh, but there is a couple of things in this race I will just mention fast. Uh, there is like with the tactical approach, they're like uh, when you guys said that nobody wants to be on the rail. So he was last into the first quarter almost, and and he, he just go fly off the rail and. Um, when when Aki did go out there, when Oseola was gapping, uh, Scotty C wants to go out there too. But when he made a break and Aki go out there, he went in in Aki's position. And then suddenly David Miller pulled the right line with the point of perfect. And he can, could come up in, in uh, Celebrity Bambino's back. And then he's drifting out. And there is like four or five things who happen in this race. And the money man with the tactical approach win the Hambletonian. I, I've been high on that horse the whole year. I think the, the three races he had on 51 little earlier this year set him a little down. And he has been benefited with the nice trip, the two last races. Oh, well, race good. He's been only winning one race this year. Uh, but the race, much better than I... than I. Yeah, I always liked the horse. But this time, he, he did go up a nice last half up your day when he come out of the... The last turn, I think he was going to win the Hambletonian and Celebrity Bambin. I have a little that feeling with him too. With like like you said, Ray, when when he's close, he's brave when he can open up with a length or two. If he a horse with horse in the last turn, he he's not not the horse you bring to the war. So win respect, never been high on him. Maybe the lay six was lay six, but uh, yeah, I don't know. Tactical approach, the money man. Mike, we, we've saved you. Uh, uh, at last but not least, you were I could see your excitement interviewing Scott Zero on Adios Day at the Meadows. So even for post 10, we know you had to have this 12 to 1 winner. Of course I had. I I was I used him. I was I, I thought he had a good chance to, you know, just because if you well, just Ray, Ray talked about this on PTS podcast, though. He mentioned he talked a lot of tactical approach, if you remember that, Ray, mm -hmm. just because the race figured to set up for a closer. And, and just the way the Oaks did. So, and, and it did in some ways, I mean, you didn't have an early first, a quick first half, but you know, the, the closer got the right trip in the race and you had horses that were going backwards when he was going forwards uh, and getting the right holes to open up for him. So, I mean, the, the drive won it, obviously. I thought that Celebrity Bambino not firing made a big difference. I thought Up Your Dale was very good in the race. Uh, I thought he got a pretty good drive. He looked like he was live at the top of the stretch, too. He looked like he could win it. And uh, I thought, oh, well, was good, but he wants to be second all the time. So, and there he was again, second. I mean, how much money has he made being second all year? Uh, you know, for the you Hamiltonian him, people that are. Yeah. What's you that? You can't really get on, oh, well, for being second there. I mean, uh, that was a huge effort where he yeah, got he, beat he by a horse that did nothing the whole again. mile. He's second again. So, yeah. I mean, <laughs> but look who he lost to. Like, he so beat what? all the other horses that were around him. He lost to some horse that's not <laughs> that's the rail. That's what happens. You, when you finish second, you beat all but one. That's what happens. <laughs> <laughs> I just and can't like, see it from that. that point of view. That's great, Derek. I always want oh well to rebound. So, can you go tell that to the mutual somewhere? Does that count? Like, he went anyway, really good. He went <laughs> second. I, I but, think that uh, an Oaks and an Oaks Hambo Oaks Hambo double needs to be on the menu every year. I don't know why it's not. We have Oaks Derby double. We have all these other things. That well, ago. it needs to be on the menu. Like, I don't but, care what. I, I still would be counting the money. 
But how I can count the money? How how can winners bet be bet as a favorite, even favorite with celebrity Bambino? That that was ridiculous. Dexter, there's a lot of people that were that thought, the de thought de winners de bet. Yeah, but de were Dexter, de 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 haven't people seen the races the last one and a half month? Mm -hmm. I doubt it. <laughs> so um, you, got, you got a lot of once a year people there that are betting drivers yeah. too. Or He's, or maybe it's a horse in a in the biggest race of the year whose name is Winners Bet. And everyone goes. He was third choice in the morning line for a reason. I knew they were going to come crashing in for him. I I don't think I saw him being shorter than oh well. But um, well, up yeah. there was fifteen to one morning line, wasn't he? And he was six. Yeah, yeah so that was sure who one. did that morning line? <laughs> uh, but yeah, but I told Edison fifteen to one. I would give him six to one. That's right, you did. So credit card, credit, credit <laughs> You're giving me twenty on everything. <laughs> Me, meanwhile, yeah, I got. Well, did did some of them get 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 a check? Point of perfect. He got a check. He got a check. Uh, B, he got a check. Yeah. Yeah. Call one. <laughs> well, we got a couple minutes left here. We'll run through these last couple quickly. But to race thirteen, we got to start with Ray Catola. Buy around wins, but come on, Ray. Bias, bias, bias. Wall can go. Fifty-seven half doesn't hit the board. Yeah, that was that was a really quirky, but also I don't know if that's bias because you could tell when Todd asked the horse to quicken. Horse got green as hell, like throwing his head, drifting out. I don't know if that. I don't think that was tiring. I think the horse just didn't really know what to do, and then by around. What was funny was Dole Daly basically going, uh, I, I, I don't know why we won this race. <laughs> I didn't think we were going to be here. And, and then the horse ends up winning at 9-2 to two and uh, killing my pick four that I'd started with tactical approach. There was, a, there was a half hour, though, between the, the Hambo and this race, too. Everybody saw closers winning like crazy, and then they come with a 57 half. And, and for some reason, the eight never moved in the race until the last you know 50 feet, it seemed. So uh, the thing the thing that infuriated me is I know allegiance in all right Philly and this was another case of outside posts just don't, don't why get into the race because she was plugging along late but was never in a position where she could really get her head she wanted to go the entire way uh, but just the post didn't work for her and it's it's to me it, it's infuriating as a better when you have these races these these big races where. Even though they have a bad draw, no one's driving on. And, I mean, they're two-year-olds, so you don't want to really put them or string them out too much for only a $240,000 race. They've only had two or three starts going into it. Uh, it, 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 it. It was a weird race to bet no matter what, but I with these two-year-old races, I think they're going to play fairly towards the front because not a lot of these two-year-olds have really put together what it's like to really pass horses. Or if, have the speed yet? If Soiree Hanover had drawn inside, or there was an actual closer's bias, Soiree Hanover would have won this race. I think you know that's the best filly in the race, in my opinion, from what I watched. She didn't win, but she was in an impossible spot where she wasn't going to win. I mean, they won a fifty-eight middle, fifty-eight and two middle half. How's she going to win off a fifty-eight and two middle half? It was impossible. I think she's the horse that's you know she'll probably be bet heavy next time anyway, so it doesn't really matter. But she's the horse that I'd be on the most. Though I do think Buy Around is a very good horse, and Sunkiss Beauty's a you know decent horse too. Walk can go, just couldn't go on that day. Well, Garnett, uh, if you like something in this race from a betting standpoint, even if you like the favorite there with uh, Soiree Hanover, three to one, so a great betting board for sure. No, no, I liked Walk and Go, and Walk couldn't go. I was going, I was going to the cashier at the, <laughs> at the half, but Walk couldn't go. Um, but I, I think Derek's right. I think Soiree Hanover was best and uh, just got out tripped. Um, I, I'd go back on her next time if I got if I got the three to one she was in this race. That's I'd right. be kind of happy about that. No chance. You'd be one to two next time, Garnett. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Thomas. Yeah, this is the most uh, expensive race for me this year. I I had a pick pick four forty five dollar pick four with. Uh, uh, confederate and by the missile singles and uh, uh, five horses on tactical approach and I was one three six eight uh, deep in this race. They were second, third, and fourth, so Oof. it would be, be be around twenty five k. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's so you're not going to buy around then for no daily increase. No, I can buy I can <laughs> buy around, but I was I'm still like, why didn't I have her on my ticket like? I should. I bet on the the week before when she go a little first off, but 
uh, I'm still like when I paid 580 bucks for a dollar and I had a 45 bucks. And when I saw by the missile went off as not the favorite, I was like, this is my day. <laughs> You're smarter than me though, Thomas. I was single to Tarasi. I had to take a stand for some reason, yeah, even but, though uh, <laughs> I, I don't, I, I don't, I don't back uh, bet Oak Row horses. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 like Una Madonna is, uh, uh, it's one of the horses. When she went at the big mile uh, as a two-year-old and she got sold for 750000 and she haven't made a dime after that. <laughs> Ray was all in on Mamba It was his uh, Grove uh, horse buy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if I play $45 and, and, pick fours, it's usually five by nine by two by one. That's how I play them. <laughs> so... Uh, yeah, I, I think I appreciate most of that race. I think coming back to the winner's circle, the Ken Warrington call of buy around, send the bill to Gabe Pruitt. <laughs> <laughs> so what Derek, think, what was that? Is that what he said? Yeah, I think so. And come awesome. back to the winner's circle. <laughs> Hashtag check the game. I have a story about that, but uh, you know, we don't have enough time. <laughs> All right, quickly through race 14. Uh, Derek, we'll start with you because Kane Pace. Uh, Garnett gave us his take on it. So Confederate wins this race. Huge back half, one to five in the race. Next week, since you have a vote, Derek, uh, where, where do we land in the top 10 poll? Yeah, Confederate's my number one now. I mean, uh, you, you have to look at how they win the races, not just the fact that they won the race. And Confederate was completely in hand, just blew away these horses like they weren't in his league. And quite frankly, they're not in his league right now. You know, as to whether down the road, it's my show can come back with some of those big performances that he showed like in the North America Cup and give him a tussle. That's perhaps that's true. But right now, Confederate looks like the star of our sport right now. I mean, he looks like the star of standard bread racing in North America at this moment. And uh, none of these horses can go with him. I mean, I thought the seven colors raced well, you know, to be second and to do the best he can. But uh, Buka Fallis is a horse you might want to bet back. I mean, the horse left and had to abort the leave and then came forth over had a little bit of pace at the end of the mile. I'm looking at the chart now, came home with 26 seconds. In a better spot, Bukafalos is a, is a reasonable bet back horse, I think. Remember when uh, he used to be even money versus Confederate, and now he was 30 to 1? <laughs> well, those days are long gone. I mean, I, I don't think you're seeing uh, anything higher than uh, 3 to 5 on uh, Confederate for the next couple of starts, at least. You know, but, but and. and I, I want I want to say Derek because you you touch on it's about how they win the races and the thing the thing that's frustrated me with the top ten poll I understand the Sylvia Miles she went in the mistletoe Shali, but qualitatively when you watch Confederate race even though he lost the North America Cup by this much how 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 did it take until now for him to be number one he's the same Sophie horse he's undefeated. been she was undefeated he well, wasn't undefeated. But how he had won multiple stakes. He had one stake. Well, Ray, I think what's important is, and obviously at this point I know enough of the voters that I've kind of discussed it out. I think everyone has different voting styles. So with that in mind, like, what is your top priority item? Is it, well, first and foremost, also, there's also people that voted like a week-to-week -week pool versus like a whole year pool. I mean, there's so many different, because we're not given any specific, well, you're aware where Ray used to have a vote in the poll. I, I, mean, I used to. There's no specific voting criteria we're given to vote from, so we as voters kind of have to make our own set of rules per se. So I know for a fact my rules are different than Derek's per se, or different than Garnett's. So, I mean, I guess with that in mind, you have to lay out how you think the voting should go, what you're basing it on, and, and that kind of stuff. Now, it, it, like, admittedly, it is all subjective, but at the very least, I, I like to think that in my subjectivity, there's a little level of objectivity, which is, you know, of course, like the old kind of everyone has it kind of thing. I've been watching races not as long as many of the people on this panel here, but I've been watching races for a fairly long time, and I can count on my hand the number of horses who visually impress me every time they step on the track. Confederate in every single race he's been in, whether he's won, whether he's lost, and he's had this with him since he was a two-year-old. We all knew he was a freakishly fast two-year-old. Maybe some people were trying to discredit him because it was at Lexington when he was showing a lot of speed, a lot of late foot, and everyone goes, that track's typically faster. But even Garnsdale, I remember the very first race this guy went this year. Uh, you, you were you were saying the exact same thing of, I can't believe he got there, right? Yeah, the, yeah. The, the way the, – the, the, the natural ability this horse has to turn gears and how quick that top gear is – to me is is so adamantly eye-catching 
that I'm astounded someone could say Sylvia Hanover because she's undefeated is the best horse in the country. But don't you have to accomplish something? Just because you have speed, does that mean we should just pick any horse that has speed and you know give them the when Confederate the one won going? the Meadowlands pace, he didn't even go number one. When he lost the it's still, my show by this much. Pace, he, he had one stakes win. How many stakes wins did Sylvia Hanover have at that point? At 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 that well, point, well, we're talking in so, the year. In the yeah, year, well, I, when I look at it, I look at it. As, I don't look at it as a week to week thing. I look at it as a yearly thing. But give a little bit more credit to a horse that just did something versus a horse that did something six weeks ago per se. And for me, Sylvia Hanover previous before the cane pace, Sylvia Hanover had a better overall resume in terms of wins than Confederate did. If Confederate would have won the North America Cup, he would have been my number one. He didn't win. You know, did he look good? Yeah, he looked good. I, he's looked good every single start. I love them coming into this year. I still love him now. I think he's a great horse. I think he's the star of the sport right now as far as I'm concerned. So, but he needed that second stakes win to move him to the top, in my opinion. That so, is, Ray, and that's where I'll have a different opinion, too. I'll let Thomas that, say something. I, yeah, also but, look- uh, that, I would just say, so, Derek, uh, so Daniel Dubé is your decision to pick Sylvia Hanover. <laughs> That's exactly what I'm thinking this whole time. <laughs> because legitimately, the, yeah. the fact to me, when you talk about it's the way they win to a degree, it's also the way they lose because we all knew Confederate going into the Meadowlands pace. We, we, I think you had to scrap for straws to try and beat Confederate looking at that form. And he upheld that with flying colors. And the fact that even after that, People were still talking about resume. To me, it, it, it's astounding because you watch the North America Cup. He's the best horse of that race. Scotty Z, Scott Zeron had it's my show in the right spot to win the race. But in terms of who was the most impressive and also who has reinforced that with every start he's had, who we've also talked about continuously as traffic trouble, but has loads of ability. I'm just amazed that it's taken this long. For, for everyone to finally go Confederate's number one. He's Maybe been that's why you don't one. have a vote anymore. No, it's because I, I forgot I to one vote. Point. <laughs> Honestly, one, one point that I, I think that should be made is, is too, I think it's it's the, when you're looking at the poll, it's, it's who these horses are facing as far as what's the toughest division. I think that the three-year-olds is an extremely tough division. Like there's a lot of good horses and that's your matter. I mean, it, you know, it's great. It's like almost like a college football poll where if you're beating up on cupcakes every week, it doesn't really matter if you're undefeated or not. It's, it, you know, stakes win this and that. But it's what's the best division? And and right now, I think the, the three-year-olds are, are probably it's it's the top division. It, it's, it's right now. So Confederate should be number one. So I think that that's something that you need to look at also. I agree with Mike just said in that what Confederate faced in the cane pace, I thought was a better group of horses than what Sylvia Hanover beat in a five-horse field as well. So that also weighs into my decision making as well. See, for me, what I think, and Ray, I know we discussed this, you might be, do agree with it, but you, you keep saying Confederate was best in North America Cup. You know, he may have been, but at the end of the day, I don't think it's my place to determine who was best out of a race if they didn't win. And at the end of the day, when I looked at resumes at one oh, come point, on. obviously now it's a different story, but it's my show. One point is undefeated, seven for seven. He's beaten Confederate and they're only head-to-head matchup. I, I don't think it's my place to put Confederate jumping. It's my show at that point until he beats up one and defeats him. Now that's my show losing the you know the uh adios obviously where confederate's gone with it from now now it's obviously clear but at the time i I just don't think it was my you know again that's my personal voting opinion i don't think it was my place to say because he lost the race but he was still that's horse at at, at that point it comes down to eyeballs because i i only know the eyeballs i have and as you know mike's been working with me a really long time you don't you you've been with me for as long garnsdale's worked with me for so it's rare for me to have this kind of sentiment for a horse for me to actually say i this is this horse amazes me and confederate every single time i hate absolutely everything but ray i agree with all of that I think I, I thought he was tons of the best in the North America Cup, but he didn't get there. And at that point, like Derek said, you know, if Sylvia keeps winning and you want to talk about visually impressive horses, that one race, the Meadowlands was something nobody's ever seen, may never see again. But now the Confederates got the Meadowlands pace and, and this cane pace, and they were both pro- probably the two best performances of the year. 
even though Sylvie's undefeated, now I got to jump Confederate over her. But I couldn't do it after the North America Cup, even though I knew he was the best horse. There's got to be some. It's got to be a, a pole of accomplishment too. And you know, if he's the best horse, but at the end of the year, how about? But he's probably. Gonna I don't. Be wait, wait, wait. Before, I don't mean to cut you both off, but here's a good point for you, right? Right. I think oh well is the best three-year-old trotter from what I've seen in the Hamilton. Yes, My, but he's got one win. I can't vote for him because he's only got one win. Doesn't matter what I think. I think he's the best, but that doesn't mean I can vote him the best. He doesn't have the the resume to be the best. In my in my mind, Hamiltonian Breeders' Crown poll. While in one way, people and this this goes to what Edison said. It's it's a differentiation of what the priority is. In my mind, it's who are the who are the standout horses? No no matter what, top ten standout horses. You can consider resume, of course. Confederate, though, you, you watch that replay in the North America Cup. I don't know how you think that's the horse's fault that he lost. You could you could see T Timmy was really upset after that race because of how the trip worked out. I don't know how you docked that from the horse at all. I uh, sure he was second, but at a certain point too, we're talking about top tens. These are the top ten horses, and these horses are they're as good as the numbers on their page but they're also as good as the performances they put in and the and the spots that they're put into so we see we see a horse who gets a pocket trip go a world record are we going to say that horse is number 1 versus a horse that cut a mile that went insanely fast but maybe didn't go a world record like it, the point yes actually probably right <laughs> well no the, the well, it, it, it all depends but it ultimately erases the point that to a certain degree we look we we put resume aside for for what for what we see and at the very least in in my eyes i have never seen a pacer like confederate and maybe that's my inexperience in this i only have a decade ish in this sport but i'm i'm really curious what this horse can do and we just it, it's just amazing to me that it took to august for us to go he's the best yeah but right we just do it easy we go with newsroom <laughs> right, Ray, if I'm allowed to take a horse that lost and extrapolate what I think they could have done, I'm going to take one for six unicorn blue chip next week and make her number one. <laughs> uh, sir, I, to me, I, I know what Confederate can be. I know he doesn't have the wins, but come co like we all saw the caveat in the North America Cup. We've watched this horse week to week. I that that's my case. It's as simple as that. He should have been Yo, number one the entire time. What's the difference when he gets the number one? He's there now. So he will be there now tomorrow whenever they put out the poll. Why? Why you're arguing a point that doesn't need to be argued? No, it, to to me it, it it's 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 overdue. If Tom Hill can do it for Grace Hill, I can do this for Confederate. Okay. This I'm is gonna... not Miley Cyrus song. It's not about the climb. It's just a matter of who's there at the end. I'm going to cast a first place vote for like, I don't even know what, something just, just for racing. Hey, how about maybe buy the missile? Mike, tell buy... us post 10, buy the missile, another post 10 winner. Yeah, the missile. He's back. Yeah, I mean, he's he's a really nice horse. He's really fast. Uh, the post didn't really matter. It was a 9-0, actually, because uh, they had a scratch in that race. But, um, you know, he, he shows his class. That's the thing. And and uh, Tattoo Artist somehow gets bet again. And uh, I've been against him pretty much all year. And, you know, Dexter again found he a raced, way. He raced well. He's just second he best to a very good horse. Yeah, he's a really good horse. Just not good enough. By, by the missile, thank you. By the missile it was my best bet on the card. Got me out for the day, and you know what? He really gives me something to look forward to in this older ranks, where I feel like throughout the year, you know, there's some good horses in there, but no horses to be excited about. I think by the missile per potentially could be a horse to be excited about, you know, down the road as he gets a couple more races under his belt and. You know, maybe could be a star in the in these ranks uh, as the time goes on. He's a gelding, so he could do this for a while if he stays healthy. So Garnett, uh, obviously for us in this race, at least unfortunately, a scratch of Billy Clyde, who one of our workshop students uh, jogged. But I got to yeah. throw in there, speaking back to jogging at Race Nickers, my first time jogging a horse and uh, was handed the lines almost immediately. I, I think the race assistant thought I had way more experience than I did, but at least I figured it out. <laughs> And that horse was Tighten Your Grip, who I think was second at Saratoga Harness on Friday night. And I bring this all up because I get a chance to tell him on Friday night at Saratoga Harness. But I know Mark McDonald will text me after some of these shows and listens into them. So if Mark McDonald's listening to this one, he should be well aware that Tighten Your Grip only finished second on Friday night because of all that good work I put into him on Wednesday. 
Yeah, and when we saw Billy Clyde was scratch sick, I said to Madison, the girl that was uh, jogging him, I asked her if she sneezed on him, and she looked at me like that could be a thing, right? Um, kind of funny. <laughs> but uh, in this race, I bet forever, boy. And um, at, heading towards the three quarters, I'm like, this is great. I'm going to get by the missiles cover. And when they both they moved, moved to the outside, and by the missile put three lengths on him as fast as I could rip my ticket in half. And that was that for Forever Boy. And then, you know, the story of the race was by the missile. I texted I texted Derek right after the race. I'm like, holy smokes, you got five to two on him. And then great all the, oh, the bets he made, which was quite a lengthy uh, page. Good for that's him. a good that's a good good thing, Derek. Then you can buy a round. <laughs> <laughs> so Ray, you said you were on Tarazi. So A, tell us about the three to one price you got on. But B, wow, you know what? I stood up for Kelly Pataski as the gold standard. Look at the chart in this race. Nandolo N's odds are 10.03. It's got to be 10.30, right? We, we don't have penny breakage in New Jersey. <laughs> I I saw Tarasi was 3-1. to one and I, I, I said it the entire time. I don't know what price we're going to get because people will bet the 47 and 4 mile. And Tarasi, when, when Tarasi was at Oak Grove, he's... He ha he sometimes a hundred percent. He sometimes not a hundred percent. This looked like a race where he was maybe like eighty percent, uh, and he couldn't get under one forty eight. I think on the right conditions he can. But this was the same thing with um the first division of the Sam McKee. There's some horses that can break one forty eight. There's some that really can't. And that was the a ones huge step up in class for this horse, though. No, it it isn't. I because. When I saw this horse at Oak Grove, this horse was showing gears in parts of the races where he really shouldn't. And also so easily because he had a hiccup, actually. He he fell during a post parade and then was scratched and was out for a couple weeks, came back, had a race where he really didn't look good and then made a total 180 in just a week after that. And so th th this horse has always been something. He was lightly raced at two, lightly raced at three. And this four-year-old season, the fact that he's able to go this fast this soon, I, I, I don't really see it as a he class. The, I did it my way. He was the, the I did it my way at Oak Grove, and that horse is still racing. <laughs> I, he, I don't. He, he beat P.L. Austin. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't, I, I don't. And, see and that. that he, he, Ray doesn't think by the missile was a, a class. Uh, you know, P.L. Or... He, he wasn't twenty claimer for not so long ago. <laughs> I look, I I I'm of the case with Confederate. I think Derek has every you got three reason. to one. I I I with my logic for Confederate, I'm of all agreement that Derek could put by the missile in the top ten. I I see the exact same things, not necessarily in Confederate, five. but no, because th this horse twenty six and three, Yannick was pulling him up in the final strides. He barely raised a muscle against Tattoo Artist. Of course, Tattoo Artist, uh, once he gets headed, he's not really that brave. Um, but I I I would watch for Tarasi later in this season. I laugh at his class. Now he's a fast horse and all he needs is just the right trip to be able to break through. He, he showed against hours of 20,000. It's different against free for all pacers, but you know, he, he has that turn of gear to him. He just needs a couple more starts to really grow into himself. All right, I can Thomas, read you my top 10. If you want it, <laughs> huh? I'm not Thomas, bring us home on this racing card. Yeah, I think we're finished. But the good thing with Confederate, maybe nobody has seen it. We still have the plugs left. Oh yeah, yeah. forty-seven and three, five and four. All righty. Well, race sixteen, Hurricane Johnny Boy, seven oh one p.m. off time, just about seven <laughs> hours after it started. So a massive sixteen race card on Hamiltonian Day. Um, as always, we we thank the Hamiltonian Society for their sponsorship of the show, and uh, well, we'll. Go around to wrap it up here quickly. Ray, we'll start with you. Give us, all right, we're going to ask for a lot here. Give us the social medias. Give us whatever plugs you want to give us and tell us your highlight of this Hamiltonian day. I was going to say, I, I was wrapping the press release for the Sam McKee Memorial. And then I saw Hurricane Johnny Boy was six to one. He was my top pick everywhere. And I didn't bet him to get out. I, I needed White Barrio to get me out in the Whitney, thankfully. Um, but that aside, uh, I don't know, my name's Ray Catolo. You could just search me. There's a lot of stuff that comes up. A lot of good stuff, too, I might add. Sometimes you look people up and not good stuff comes up. I hope to never be one of those kinds of people. Uh, Harness Land is my Horse Racing Nation show. Uh, we did stuff for the Hamiltonian. Maybe there'll be more stuff in the future. I have no idea. Uh, I do other stuff, though. It's just, just I don't know. I don't, do it for me. I, I It's pretty self-explanatory how to find me. Just don't come to my house. Don't find me like that. 
because if you find me like that, I'll find you, and you don't want that. Is your Hamiltonian Day highlight missing Hurricane Johnny Boy? That, that's what you got for me? Oh, yeah. I forgot about that part. Um, <laughs> The highlight, uh, you know, I think my favorite thing about the Hamiltonian this year is that it wasn't obvious. Because, like, there are some years where the horse wins, and it's a fun race, and you go, but I mean, we, we expected that to happen. Sometimes it's refreshing to be reminded that uh, strange things can still happen in harness racing. And, I, and to, to me, I think that was the most fun part of tactical approach winning the Hamiltonian. Derek? I could tell everyone my bad, you know, uh, bet story of the night, which was in the came pace where I picked 537. And somehow I screwed up punching the numbers and punched in 532, 5311. Mm-hmm. And it came in 537 and paid $65. So you yeah, like me. That's, that's scary. <laughs> that's my bad betting story of the night. Dear F, uh, dot com slash harness dear harness digest newsletter dear harness on facebook and twitter come check us out lots of content we'll have a, another pretty nice newsletter this week uh, recapping some of the hambo stuff and also some fresh content two big races coming up this weekend uh, the milstein at northfield and the dan patch at hoosier so mm-hmm. uh, lots of good stuff coming up Garnett. Uh, my Twitter handle is at GoCashKing. I do some work for Harness Link. I'm actually going to be covering the Milstein. I'll probably put out a uh, handicapping page uh, the, the day before or the day of. I'll do a race recap. Uh, I work for Derek doing DRF Harness. Thank you, Mike, for doing six days in a row for me because I would have been dead if I tried to do it. That's how busy the workshop is. My highlight was when Hall of Famer Ken Weingartner brought fresh bagels into the conference room where we were working uh, first thing in the morning. Actually, no. Honestly, my highlight was seeing... The two of the students that that we had in the workshop have a story and a picture. Uh, you know, it's, it's the payoff for, you know, it's a lot of hard work that week. In addition to all the other stuff that we're doing, we're also working. Um, and, and, and that shows part of the payoff. And it was really rewarding to see that for me. Mike? Well, I have lots of stuff. Um, first, go to nahupex.com. We had great coverage this weekend and uh, for everything. Um as far as the highlights go, uh, it was nice to have. I thought we had stars. You had like Confederate. You had buy the missile, but you had prices too. There was there was a lot of good betting this weekend. Uh, you know, it's a long day, sixteen races, but tons of good betting. Uh, huge scores to be had if you could get it right. I didn't quite get it right, but at least I gave myself a chance. I felt good about that. Uh, I got actually mentioned by Garnett on the on the uh, the uh, Meadowlands broadcast, which was awesome. He didn't have to do that, so I appreciate that and. Uh, Ray's Harness Land I thought was pretty cool this week, too. So there was a lot of good stuff this weekend. Uh, really enjoyed these podcasts. we got another one coming up for the Dan Patch this week. So, I mean, we're getting it every week. you, you got to pay attention. Thomas? Uh, Confederate. Uh, tac- uh, tactical Approach. Scotty C. I'm on Twitter. Uh, yeah, Norwegian uh, nickname there. Uh, Travel Consulent. I have um, some uh, opinions uh, that somebody knows about, <laughs> Derek. <laughs> uh, now, working with horses on every aspect. So, but uh, very happy with the, the pools on Madelands this weekend. Uh, I think it was almost a new record since the new grandstand. It was like I seven think and a half million. Seven point eight uh, million is a new record since the new grandstand beat last year. And that's without like, the international handles yet. Yeah, we and don't like, know what the internationals. It was a good and crowd. Like, and, like, crowd too. and like Derek knows, my opinions have been uh, I've been mailing very much with the Netherlands. I I think still there is very much opportunities to to change something with the, the information out to the betters. Turbad have it. We have it home in Europe, and the the pools would be bigger if we get more information out to the betters. All righty, well, to wrap us up, uh, Madison Hatter at Edison underscore 1999 underscore on Twitter. And, uh, yeah, I mean, highlights of the week, I guess I'll say with. Obviously, I'll, I'll echo Garnett sediments. Obviously, working with workshop students uh, for a second year in a row now has definitely been a pleasure. And enjoy uh, all six of the students that I, I've now seen in, in two years. And Garnett working with you and Nick is always good. And in fact, I'll, I'll see you guys in a couple weeks when I'm up in Canada there. Actually, less than a week. Next week. Uh, gosh, next Monday we'll be – Grand River at this time. Fantastic. That's right. That's right. Might have to take another week's vacation. <laughs> um, but uh, a jogging horse for the first time. That, that's for sure my highlight of the week. But uh, Hamiltonian Day, uh, well, 
it's a good chance to wrap it up with our in the money plug here. Obviously a pleasure to work for in the money media. We thank them for their sponsorship of these shows. And my uh, Hamiltonian day was spent at Whitney day at Saratoga with Pete Forentau, a beautiful table in the turf terrace, watching the races, uh, obviously uh, a tough day at Saratoga, obviously all of us here. And I'm sure the entire in the money media network, obviously sending our condolences to the connections of, of Maple Leaf Mel, obviously an incredibly difficult day up there. But um, besides that, still always a fantastic day at Saratoga. Always a, a great time to be up there. And uh, again, an unfortunate sour note to the day, but still a pleasure to hang out with Pete and everyone else up there. And uh, with that, we'll just about wrap it up. We will thank uh, again, the Hamiltonian society and the money media for their sponsorship. Uh, we'll thank uh, producer AJ for helping us out this evening. All my panelists for joining us. And uh, as Mike alluded to, yeah, several things coming out this week. Uh, in fact, a lot of people in this panel will be involved in them. So Wednesday evening, look for Ray Catolo and I late at night, the good Mohawk analysis for this coming Saturday. Uh, look for Mike Rabozzi, Thomas Fenson, and I early Thursday morning doing some work with uh, Sweden as we go to Albi for the Albi Store Pre this Saturday. And uh, several of us will be back this coming Thursday evening with hopefully some special Caesars guests, maybe a little Emily Gaskin, Jacob Reinheimer appearance for the Damn Patch Stakes at uh, Hoosier Park Friday evening. So lots of stuff coming up here. But as always, thanks for joining us here for this Hamiltonian re Roundtable recap. Hopefully you had a great Hamiltonian 2023 day. And obviously, we're already looking forward and planning for 2024. Thank you, Ed. I did have a really great one. Thank you. <laughs>